Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Wagwan, brethren. My uh, birthday brother. <laughs> His birthday September 3rd as well. Did you oh, know that? Yeah. Oh, Malcolm Gladwell, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank how, you. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. How'd you make it through the pandemic, man? I was fine. I was upstate. Mm-hmm. Enjoying myself. It's pretty mild up there. It wasn't there weren't a lot of cases, so got a lot of work done. Did a lot of running, mm-hmm. you know. I think we spoke to him during the pandemic. I thought we did one time. We did. On Zoom. Yeah, we did on Zoom. We did. One time. On Zoom, yeah. Yeah, we did. Okay. You said you got vaccinated the first day you could, right? I that, did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, the day they changed the, you know, when they started drop, or dropping the ages, I was there. Then and the next morning, I was like calling them to getting my. As soon as you heard your age, you was like, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in there. The one what privilege of being an old guy. <laughs> what sold you? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's this new vaccine technology. It's the best vaccine technology we've ever had. They had ninety, what is it, ninety five percent efficacy. That's good enough for me. I mean, I, <laughs> I was the same way. <laughs> did you get the Johnson and Johnson, or did you get the? Um... Got Moderna. Okay. I got, which I I consider the hipster choice. I the you know it's the small <laughs> upstart as opposed to the big pharma company. No, there's no difference. But yeah, I got Moderna. What do you say to people who feel like they don't want to get it until it's fully FDA approved? Well, we've done more research on this vaccine than almost any other vaccine in history. So, you know, the FDA is just dragging its feet, but that's no reason to risk your life. Mm. Why do you think they're dragging their feet? Like, what would be the reason? If if you know all of these people are dying, if you know all the people are getting sick, like, what would be the reason for them dragging their feet? You know, there's probably a, a bunch of different reasons. One is I don't think that there's a lot of people saying crazy things that aren't true about it. Mm-hmm. That's one problem. Uh, I don't think that um, uh, political leaders, and also, you know, there are a lot of people in society with a lot of uh, clout who need to be standing up and saying, get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, not just politicians, but people from, uh, you know, in music and sports and all kinds of different realms need to be being kind of forceful about people. That's crazy that you have to say that, though. That we look to the celebrities and athletes as opposed to the experts and, <laughs> and the Why leaders the of the free world. No, but it, but I mean, I think those those, you know, that that's not a mistake. I mean, because celebrities and athletes are people who are just as, in many ways, just as thoughtful, and have an awful lot of of legitimate social influence because they're serious people, right? They and they builds up a following, and they should they can use that following. For yeah. In situations like this, I want information, not influence, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, information mm-hmm. is what's going to make me feel comfortable about. Yeah. The only one person up there in this room that hasn't gotten his vaccine yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting on it to be fully FDA approved, and then I'll make yeah. my move. <laughs> It'll <laughs> happen soon. Mm-hmm. It'll happen soon. So you jumped in the podcast world. You've been yes. doing that. Been doing that. Been, like, mm-hmm. been... We had a big season this... this uh, you, have you guys been following our remake of The Little Mermaid? No, I didn't listen to that one. Got... I was I was caught up in the uh, the, the historically black colleges. I'm oh like, yeah, I, I, plan, I planned to listen to the Little Mermaid, and I saw it was in three parts. I'm like, damn, you went that deep on the Little Mermaid? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. We did. We did more. We spent more time on the Little Mermaid than the actual like length of the movie. So the movie's 90 minutes. We did like two hours. It was. Like, <laughs> no, that was. Oh, so did you? Oh, you? Do you listen to my uh, my my HBCU, my Dillard I, I stuff? I did. I did. The hypocrisy of the college ranking oh, systems. Yeah. That was that was a fascinating listen, and it was just another example of the caste system in America to me. I yeah. always wonder how they did those rankings too, because I went to Wesleyan University, right? Yeah. Oh, and so that's, fancy! Yeah, that's a small oh. liberal arts college, <laughs> and I actually taught a class at Dillard University one time too. So it's interesting you talk about like the amount of money that when it, these universities have in the bank mm-hmm. is a large part of the reason why they might get why they do get a higher High ranking. ranking. It's, I mean, it's absolutely the case. It's like this is a system. The U.S. News College rankings is a system devised to let the rich get richer. Mm -hmm. It is, if you, the biggest, the most important part of their ranking system is what's called the reputation score. Mm -hmm. And the reputation score is simply a score that's a grade that's given by other college presidents. (laughs) So like, first of all, you know, how many, I was was interested in the story of Dillard, the Siddle HBCU in New Orleans. I was. I didn't know it was considered an Ivy League school. I'd learned that listening to the podcast. HBCU Ivy, yeah, it's a really good school. Mm How many? So every college president in the country gets to grade Dillard on a scale of one to five, according to its academic excellence. Mm-hmm. How many college presidents have been to Dillard? Know the slightest thing about Dillard? Yeah. Have met somebody who went to Dillard? I mean, it's this crazy system where we let people just. So basically, what they do when they get these grades is they just award the schools 
that have the biggest name recognition, the most money in the bank, yeah. and you know the the fanciest dorms and the biggest endowments and the the the, the most famous alumni. That's not you a said way. Rich to, students too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, the, it's the ridiculous when you see how much when you look at the rankings, like how much the tuition is and how much it costs to go to school for the top schools. You know, the, and I, because I used to be like, I always look at those rankings, right? Because I look to see like where my school is, but I never understood how those rankings were even figured out. Because they also talk about like the uh, graduation rate, right? Within mm. six years, you said. Yeah. Big, another big thing is the graduation rate. And they fail to take into account that if you're a school like Dillard and you have average family income of someone at Dillard's $30,000 a year, they're, they're drawing from disadvantaged communities. It's really hard. You can't have 95% graduation rate mm -hmm. when you're coming from a family where if your mom loses her job, you got to go home and help out. Mm -hmm. right. Or when your dad gets sick, you can't, they can no longer afford your tuition. You know, we're punishing schools for trying to serve communities um, that aren't wealthy, mm -hmm. which is crazy, right? Why are they doing that? This just, this drives me absolutely crazy. That the amount of weight we give to these random ranking systems that are uh, completely inconsistent with our values, with what now, we care about as people. What is Dillard ranked at? I mean, the reason I picked them is that I looked on the U.S. News rankings, and they're basically at the bottom. So, 171, it says, or two something like that. Yeah, yeah, they have a category for schools that they think are so terrible they're not even going to bother giving them an exact. And I think that's completely crazy. It's just a, it is a, it's yeah, an insult. To especially us. when you listen to the way you describe the school, but also, oh, man, I can't remember what, what the major was, but they had more people graduating from, from th that than Harvard? Physics. Physics. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the, so here's, a, here's a, a, so a fascinating fact about HBCUs is they, they punch way above their weight. They, they don't have a lot of money, and they only educate a small number of people, but they produce a hugely disproportionate number of of black grad of future PhDs, of particularly in science and uh, and math and, and engineering, Dillard in 2019 had produced 13 physics uh, 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 undergraduate degrees. Harvard produced exactly one African American uh, uh, physics uh, undergraduate degree. So Harvard's got all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. You know the the absolute smartest students, the most brilliant professors. Are they actually producing, uh, they have hundreds of African-American students at Harvard. Are they turning out people with high quality degrees? No, they're not. It's the, it's the schools like Dillard that are. And, we're, and yet we're not giving these schools the credit for doing that. And, and you brought up a good point on the podcast. You said how, you know, the first thing people would think is, well, it's probably more black people at Dillard than Harvard. But that wasn't the case. Yeah, Harvard's got a lot of African-American students, but they're not, there's something, something special. There's something in the water in a lot of these HBCUs that allows them to do the hardest thing of all, which is to get schools, kids from uh, from relatively disadvantaged backgrounds through the most difficult majors. So science and math and those kinds of areas. And same thing with down the road from Dillard, there's Xavier University in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they produce more pre-med students pound for pound than any school in the country, African-American wow. pre-med students. What does the Maybe register system the even mean, though? Like, what... You know, like if you're like, OK, my school is ranked this on the list. Like, what does that really mean in the real world? It makes it easier for the school to raise money. It's okay. all about money. Mm -hmm. It's only about money. These all these things. If I can go, if I'm the president of a school that's ranked fourth on the U.S. News rankings, I can go to the big donor and say, wow, you know, look at me. You know, you can give money to one of the top schools in the country, which brings up this interesting point, which always drives me crazy. If you're a really rich dude, why would you give your mm -hmm money to a, a school that already has money right. Right. it's the craziest thing <laughs> you should you should look at the school like i once did a big podcast uh episode on this billionaire uh financier in new york who gave 500 million dollars to harvard which has 40 billion dollars in the bank why would you give half a billion dollars to a school that already has 40 billion who we does too that much money already. it's like it's like it's like walking into the gucci boutique and just saying guys here's i got a couple thousand dollars i think you might need it to tide you through these <laughs> difficult times nobody does that right? right i think there's a lot of rich people in this country i think are are they're, they're crazy they that's really what, are crazy I, that's why i want to hear you talk to jeff bezos ex-wife because I love what she's doing yeah. as far as the HBCUs and she how she been, yeah. spreads her wealth out there. Now, now, how did how did U.S. News and World Report end up owning the college ranking space? By chance. I mean, they started doing it as a promotional gimmick in the 80s. 
and it caught on. The thing that's about rankings is whenever you do a ranking of anything, people fall in love with it, right? <laughs> Everyone likes yeah, they do. The Forbes somebody, list. We love the Forbes list. <laughs> we all, if somebody did a list of the top like morning <laughs> radio shows and you guys were ranked number one, you would absolutely say, hey, we're ranked number one, It would be 172 one, right? on that list. Yeah. Yeah, you would, like, <laughs> we can't help ourselves. Even though, even if I told you that the the, the logic behind putting Breakfast Club number one was like full of holes. You would say, yeah, but still. And you'd Wait put, a minute. There's no holes here. All right. <laughs> the source has been ranking us number one for about five years. But now. I believe that. Right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you what? know, it's money, though, because, you know, if you look at where you live at, right? Yeah. It's based off of what the schools are ranked at. So if you're in a district where a school is ranked top five, let's say, in the state, Mm-hmm. You know that your taxes are going to be higher. You know that the houses in that area are going to cost more money. Mm-hmm. So it's based. It's a number game that yeah. that plays with money. You know. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, these things. This the the whole question of higher education, or education in general in this country, has somehow been perverted into something that is all about um, how much money you can you can assemble. We think what a good school is is a school that has the most money in the bank and spends the most money on um, on educating students, and that's not. It's not about how much money you spend. It's about the culture you create. Like I was, I spent a lot, when I was at Dillard, and I spent a lot of time talking to the students there, and you know, they would talk, the things they cared about and talked about were the relationships they had with their professors. The fact, what's one, this one girl told me that if she misses a class, her advisor calls her wow. and says, why weren't you at, I mean, it's that <laughs> kind of thing. Another student said, you know, she's got a problem. She can call the president of Dillard, and he will call her back. Wow. You name me a school. Like, it's that kind yeah. of family yeah, that right. <laughs> family environment. And that's what matters in helping you get an education, help you navigate a difficult time, help you when you're away from your family for the first time. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, of, of cases, situations where that kind of family atmosphere matters, that kind of supportive environment. That's what makes a great school. You can't measure that with money. Right. You know what I liked? I didn't have a core curriculum. That's kind of why I chose it. Yeah. Because I didn't want to have to take courses that I wasn't interested in taking. And so I was able to take just the courses I wanted to. And that was a major reason. And then my school was super liberal. Mm-hmm. And I was, um, I liked that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That is one of the most famously. That's yeah. like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and, uh, and it only gets more and more liberal every year. But you know what? With an HBCU, you know, I went to Hampton. Mm-hmm. It was more family. Yeah. Like if there was a problem or a situation, it seems like teachers, mm-hmm. the deans, they all came together to make sure that you were OK. Yeah. I don't know how it was in Wesleyan, but it, that's how it was. Even with, with taking tests and there was a problem or situation or there was a financial burden or there was a death in the family. It was more family where it, it was like I can call my dean and say, hey, this is my problem. Can you help me out? That's what I realized about that. I wanted to ask you about the ranking. Do you think they would take the rankings away but since it hurts so many HBCUs? They should. I mean, what I think is that schools should now, they only exist because schools uh, participate in them, right? They send in their data, they give them, a, and I think it's time for schools to start boycotting them. If I'm rate uh, 171, why would I send in my data anymore? Well, they, they don't even, the, the Diller doesn't. I mean, those they gave up. But what U.S. News does is they simply estimate what right. your ranking is, right? But if everybody walked away, the system would collapse. And I think, I, I, at the end of one of my, of, uh, my podcast on this, I said... You know, I think it's time for students at some of the schools that are being, um, the schools that are being privileged by these rankings, the ones at the top, that are, I think, unfairly at the top. The kids need to stand up and say no more. Mm -hmm. If I'm a student at Yale or Harvard or something, kids need to stand up and say, we are being unfairly privileged by a ranking system that's just set up to make schools like us succeed and schools that don't educate wealthy kids fail. And it is wrong for us to be participants in such a system. I am waiting for the student activists at the big Ivy League schools to stand up and say that. That'll never happen. Like, why would people give up their privilege in America? They also may not be aware of it, though, because this is not something that I knew yeah. how these rankings were. I just would read the list when it comes out and be like, okay, I never thought about what goes into making this list. No, I yeah. think they're aware. But Char- Charlamagne, hey, but this is interesting. Why wouldn't, why is it so hard for people to give up their privilege? I don't know, because I say it on the radio all the time. I would, I want white people to use their privilege to combat prejudice. You, you know, if you're going, if you, we know you have privilege. Mm-hmm. So it's not like something you can just put on the table and say, here, I don't want it anymore. But at least you use it to combat the prejudice that exists in our yeah. society. I agree with you, but I, and I agree that it's never going to happen, that these kids at these elite schools are going to say, no, no more, let's, we're dropping out. But I, I'm puzzled by why it's so difficult for people 
who already have everything, right? If you're a student at Yale or Harvard or Columbia or what have you, you know, chances are you came from a wealthy background. Mm-hmm. You went to the highest quality high school. Your, you know, your parents can provide for every need. When you graduate, you're going to get a fantastic job. You have everything going for you. Mm -hmm. Why can't you then stand up and say, all right, in this one respect, my school has benefited from this crazy biased ranking system. Um, Let's all get together and say, this is one small part of our privilege that we can surrender. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change any of the other facts I've told you about that. Family's still rich, still getting a great job still living in a fancy dorm, mm-hmm. everything's still going your way. Why can't you surrender just this one little? I think it's hard for some people to even admit that they have privilege because yeah. if they admit that they have privilege and they feel like maybe I'm inferior and I'm not getting what I'm getting just because I'm good or talented, I think that's why first you have to admit that you even have privilege, I don't think they yeah. which I think is hard to do. But I don't yeah. think they care. Like, I don't think they care. Like I don't think they know sometimes, too. Nah, though. like, I went to a predominantly white high school, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't care. It was the blacks stayed at the black table. The blacks parked where the blacks parked. The blacks played basketball on this field. I don't and like how you say the blacks. That's, that's, what it was. that's what it was. It was, it was, the, it was the Italians. It was the Italians on this on one side. The Asians on one side, and and all the African American, all the black yeah. people on the other side. But that's what it was. Nobody cared yeah. until it was basketball game time. Then it was yeah. like, come on, guys, this is what it was. Or football t- football game time. Other than that, nobody cared. Yeah. It wasn't like nobody looked out and said, hey, I'm going a, I'm to a look out for, for those or park over here with us. It wasn't like that. It was so damn separated. Nobody cared until I went to an HBCU and then it was a different thing. Is that why you went? Um, Yeah. Yeah. And you wouldn't, if somebody, if I, if I go back to your 18-year-old self and I say, here's a full ride at Harvard or you can go to Hampton, which would you have chosen? Hampton. Yeah. And the reason being is you got to think my parents are from the South. So growing up, that's all they knew was HBCUs. It was either mm-hmm. going to be Morehouse, Hampton, or Howard. That was yeah. my, my. That was one thing my parents wanted. I want you to go to HB, uh, HBCU. That was it. Yeah. I, I would have went to HBCU yeah. regardless. You don't strike me as a Morehouse man. <laughs> nah. <I don't. laughs> Hampton University all day, ain't you? You know what was difficult about college for me coming out of high school is that, um, you know, I went to high school in Brooklyn. It was a private school. Mm-hmm. And because I got into Wesleyan, some of the white kids... I remember one in particular was upset. He wanted to go there. He said, I only got in because I was black. Yeah. And so, you know, they'll tell you that, like, the bar for getting into some of these schools is not the same or whatever. So it turned into this whole big thing. Like, well, you only got in there because you're black and I would have got in, you know, otherwise. Does anyone ever say to a white kid who gets into that school, you only got in because you're rich? Right. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's it's because that's equally true, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. and then, or... The number of kids who get into these schools because their parents went yep, there. Yep, that's right. right. Their parents Did you go only there, they get in because you're mm-hmm. you're you're a mm-hmm. legacy? I mean, nobody wants to. It's it's so easy to pick on like black people on this matter. Nobody and they don't want to own up to the fact that they got in because their parents went there or because their daddy gave a million dollars or some other. Yo, how do you think rich white kids could could benefit? You know, from attending a HBCU, but also benefit the HBCU by attending. Well. uh... One of the things that the president of Dillard told me, I uh, was a really interesting guy. Um, he thought it was really important that uh, students at Dillard be taught in particular, but also exposed. He said they got to be taught by uh, a range of people. They can't just be taught by African Americans. They must. Mm-hmm. They should be taught by white teachers as well, by Asian teachers. He thought it was. Th- he thought that was a crucial part of the um, experience, the educational experience. And I agree. Do I want you know, I I do think it is important that HBCUs continue to have a majority African American um, culture because that's the reason they exist. That's mm-hmm. what makes them special and important. In our, um, but I, I think that uh, you know there are a lot of students, white students, who if they spent some time on those campuses, could have their eyes open mm-hmm. in a really positive way. But how would it make the rankings of the HBCUs go? Oh, that's oh, what I mean. oh, I see. Oh, that because. Um, yeah, for a variety of reasons, but if you think about it, um, I became convinced that you know the biggest part of the rankings is the reputation score. Mm-hmm. So a college president um, gets to rank all the other colleges in the country on a scale of one to five, and they don't know anything about the colleges they're ranking, so they use proxies to kind of get at. 
And, you know, the more, if they see a lot of rich white kids at a school, they just assume it's a good school and they give it a five. Mm. If they see a lot of black kids at a school, they assume it's a poor school and they give it a two, right? So I was joking in my podcast by saying, look, if a school like Dillard all of a sudden had lots of white students, they <laughs> they get a better reputation score because other people would see, oh, there's this rich white kids there. Wow. Let's give them a higher. It's literally that. It's li- it is, I am not wow. being... I'm not being sarcastic or ironic here. It, this is exactly the way it works. I talked to a bunch of college presidents. I was like, you're asked by, HB, by, um, by U.S. News to rank schools on a scale of one to five. You've never been to those schools. You know nothing about them. So on what basis are you giving them a grade, right? And there, the answer was, well, I don't know. Like, of course I don't know anything about it. I just, you know, I just hand out, you know, it's like that kind of nonsense. So... Um, they're absolutely using these kinds of, they knew, I knew some kid who went there and that school looked really nice when I drove by it. It's that kind of stuff. So question, like, let's just say in the future, like, mm-hmm. you know, all of these, you know, black people who have wealth now and their kids are rich and they start going to these HBCUs. Will mm-hmm. that make the reputation score go up or it doesn't matter that they're rich to still black? Depends how strong you think <clears throat> this kind of racism still is in this country. Yeah. Right. Is it possible for a lot of uh, wealthy, you know, white college presidents to look at a school that educates black people and think it's a quality institution. I mean, are you how how optimistic are you, Sean? Man? Not none. Does curriculum does curriculum matter at all? <laughs> no, not in these rankings. It no. should. Listen, I mean, that's not what they're interested. That's not what the game's about, right? Like, wow. When you think about the whole college admission scandal, too, that happened recently, right? Uh, do you think that's something that's just the tip of the iceberg and this is still mm-hmm. going on with... Well, the system's so crazy. I mean, the idea that <clears throat> parents are convinced that unless their school... By the way, I always thought it was hilarious that the school center of the college admissions scandal was USC. Mm-hmm. So. All of a sudden, USC <laughs> parents are willing to commit felonies <laughs> to get their kids to USC. It's crazy. It's like, crazy. I mean, just go to the football games. You don't even. <laughs> you don't have to be a like. So that was kind of crazy. It's not like there's a shortage of good schools in this country. Why? Why, mm-hmm. why is it that we've uh, we're a country of you know three hundred odd million? We've convinced ourselves that only ten schools are worth going to. It's just like the nuttiest thing I've ever heard. Well, you talked about it on the podcast. I would call that like uh, that's that's rich people, that's white people flossing, right? That's how they floss. Like my child went to this school and I went to this school. Like that's how they floss. The same yeah. way rappers like to throw a bottle sometime and you know show their cars off. That's the yeah. way they floss. Yeah. Meanwhile, does anyone? This is the thing that I can't get at. So I went to school in Canada. In Canada, like people don't get that excited about where you went to college, and then, uh, but here I moved down here and like people like this is the first mm-hmm. thing that comes up. But then I noticed, you know, the older I've gotten, and now, you know, I've got this little company. We hire people. We don't, no, we don't care where they went. Not to at all. We don't even ask. Or like, your GPA. I don't think anyone cares. I don't even know cares. what my GPA so was. So why, if when you were hiring, we don't really care anymore? <laughs> right. Then why do why do parents and ki- and high school kids care so passionately if no one? Once you've once you graduated, it's just about who you are and what you do. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like it's a networking thing too. Yeah. You know, if you think about the alumni that went to your school, that you should potentially have access to because it is true like I will say at the Career Resource Center they do have a great internship program where alumni will take you in as an intern and then also thinking about the other people that go to school with you who you guys like come up together and are able to do things like oh I went to school with this person so I do feel like a lot of that is a networking opportunity yeah yeah no I've I mean I've uh that's a legit but I think those kinds of networking opportunities exist at Lots and lots of No, lots I agree stuff, with that. Right? But like, I, I feel like that's yeah. a large part of the reason why yeah. people do care about that. Yeah. I was interviewing some guy today. What's the what's the really uh influential African American uh fraternity? Kappa 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 Alpha. Kappa? That's Envy actually Psi. pledged for that. Oh Kappa. you did? Oh yeah, you did. I didn't, didn't pledge. He kept that. dropping his cane. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kappa Alpha Psi, you probably talking about. That's right, that's right. So I was talking to some guy and he goes he goes, um <laughs> Oh yeah, I went to work he went to work for Mayor Tom Bradley in Los Angeles. He was like, I said, why did you go work there? He goes, oh, he was a, he was a Kappa. I was a Kappa. Mm-hmm. Like that was, you know, so that's what you're talking about. Yeah, like, it's a real was bonding a, thing for Yeah, he was, able, he was able to. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> is that the ones? Those are the guys with the canes. With the canes. Yeah, exactly. the canes. Oh, yeah. Now, what, what was your interest in looking into uh, HBCUs? Because a couple of reasons. Um, one is, I'm, <clears throat> you know, I have this ongoing fascination with how screwed up American higher education is. 
So I started out by saying, you know, when I talk to uh, people who went to HBCUs, they say exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. They had this overwhelmingly positive experience. And then I looked on the U.S. News rankings and I saw that these schools are at the bottom, right? So my first question was, how is it a school can do such a good job educating its students that they come away saying that was one of the most important experiences of my life and simultaneously be ranked at the bottom, right? right. Those two things don't, there's something wrong with mm -hmm. that. So that was one reason I wanted to, uh, to look at it, to kind of resolve that, uh, that contradiction, right? If, uh, surely if the students who attend a school love their experience, that means the school must be good. Like that's mm -hmm. just about the most important thing that matters. Um, but more than that, um, I've gotten really interested, what I'm really interested in, um, and it's part of what I'm exploring in, in my news project too, is um, the, the more subtle ways in which discrimination persists in this country. That, you know, it's, uh, I think what's been happening over the last couple of years is that we're finally, uh, as a country, waking up to the fact that there are layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of discrimination mm -hmm. um, in all manner of different realms. You know, we've got a, uh, a, a spotlight finally on police violence last summer. But, I mean, that's been true for a couple Ever. hundred years, mm -hmm. right? But, it, like, it takes a long time for people to focus on it and to start to peel away the layers and say, you know, it doesn't solve the problem if you just hire a couple of black police officers, right? you still got more work to do. It doesn't solve the problem. And <clears throat> with, with, with higher ed, I was, I was like, you know, it doesn't solve the problem just to integrate schools, you know, or... You have to look closely, and it, that's why I want to look at the U.S. News thing, because that was an example of a highly discriminatory mm -hmm. practice that persists because people don't understand the assumptions that drive it. Um, so that's a kind of, I think you have to be actively engaged in um, peeling back more and more layers of this onion. You can't stop and say we're done. That's the thing that always drives me crazy is people who stop and say we're done. We don't have to talk about this anymore. You've got to keep working at it. What what flaws? And I want everybody to go listen to the you know the Project Dillard podcast of revisionist history. But what flaws in the algorithm cause historically black colleges to, to, to rank so low? A couple. Well, the two that we've talked about are the critical ones. The three. One is that there are a number of different ways in which your ranking as a school depends upon how much money you have. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> you know, schools that serve a predominantly African American population are going to have less money than you know, Ivy League schools, right? Just look, a school like Dillard's got a endowment of $100 million. Harvard's got 40-some-odd billion, right? So you get penalized for that. Two, you get penalized for uh, lower graduation rates. And graduation rates are not a function of how good a job the school is doing at educating students. They are a function of the economic circumstances of the students. If you choose to educate schools, students from poorer backgrounds, you will not have a 95% graduation rate. It's not going to happen, right? So that algorithm rewards you for having a high graduation rate, which means it rewards you for educating the kind of kids who can afford to stay for four years and not have any kind of family troubles or whatever, who aren't working. Like if you talk to a kid at, I was talking to kids at Dillard, you just ask them, well, what do you do? You know, do you have a part-time job? Some of them have two part-time. Do you know how hard it is? You guys, I mean, you know how hard it is mm -hmm. to stay in school if you, you're leaving every day at 3 o'clock to work on one of your two jobs and you're working all weekends. You can't do your homework. You That's can't right. do, you know, how many kids at, you know, Princeton have got part-time you know, part jobs? When they don't, right? So that fact alone, it's a lot easier to graduate 95% of your students if none of them have part-time jobs. And they you can do those uh, right? free internships, too, when your family has money. Exactly. And you can travel and go, if you live somewhere else, you know, go to another city to be yeah. able to do an internship. Whereas if you don't have that advantage or that privilege, you have to get a paid job in the summer doing whatever you can. Yeah. It's, we're not, so these rankings are not acknowledging mm -hmm. the reality of kids from uh, less privileged backgrounds, black or white, right? It's like it is a struggle to afford your tuition and stay in school yeah. if you're in the bottom half. It is easy if you're in the top half, right? So you don't give points to a school just for enrolling all the easy kids, mm -hmm. right? This is the thing that drives me nuts. Like, how can you, if you're educating a bunch of kids who went to the finest high schools in the country and you have, you have 
you know, a ton of resources at your disposal and on and on and on. Your job is really, really easy. It's not that hard, right? Like the, the I mean, it's like you shouldn't be. We shouldn't be patting you on the back, mm-hmm. right? For that, we do this so many times. It's like we pat people on the back for like, you know, catering to rich people. I'm sorry. It's like that's the easiest thing in the world. It is Even the easiest choosing thing. where you're gonna go to school, sometimes you have to choose maybe a school that is offering you. Uh, financial support as opposed to a school that maybe you wanted to go there, yeah. but it's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing to me how America finds a way to throw a middle finger to the poor on every level. Yeah. Every level. Yeah. Now, now, now if the algorithm affects the ranking of HBCUs, is it affecting the ranking of good predominantly white institutions that are that are popular? It will. The algorithm will penalize any school that chooses to educate uh kids from less privileged backgrounds and any school that doesn't have a lot of money in the bank um, and any school that doesn't <clears throat> meet the kind of conventional definition of a high prestige school. Mm-hmm. So a school that doesn't look nice, have famous alumni, all those kinds of things. So yeah, a lot of other, a lot of uh, predominantly white institutions get penalized as well. Um, but I think the penalty falls heaviest on HBCUs that are choosing to their students from some of these less privileged backgrounds. And do these white institutions really suck? You know what I mean? <laughs> they just got high rankings because of who go there? Like, do they really who knows? suck the We're not judging these schools on whether yeah. they're actually doing a good job at mm-hmm. providing an education. We're just judging them on how much money That's they have. That's crazy. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, no, it's, it Should is. it be about education? <clears throat> it should yeah. be. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Do you think that Barack Obama would have been president you think white people would have voted for him if he didn't go to Harvard? Like, what if he would have went to Dillard? You think they are yeah. more comfortable with voting for somebody who's like, well, he's a Harvard graduate? Oh, Kamala went to Howard. Kamala went to Howard. But, yeah, no, uh, I think there are a lot of things that go into... It's funny, because I'm dealing with this exact question. I'm doing this... Um, my newest project is about, among other things, is about uh, Tom Bradley, the you know first African-American mayor of Los Angeles. Um, and there's this crazy story about Tom Bradley that when he's in ni- in the 1930s, he goes to a high school in Los Angeles called Poly, mm-hmm. um, which is a very prestigious high school. And he only goes there because he's not in that district, but his mom is cleaning the uh, house of someone in that district. So he uses <laughs> that address to get, get to Poly. And there are 1,700 students of Poly and maybe 100 not kids, and he walks in, and there's a society called the, uh, there's an honor society, which has never had any black people in it. He gets elected to the honor society, and then he runs for what was called Boys League president, but basically for student council president, and he wins. Right now, just to put this in perspective, this is a guy who is a sharecropper's son Mm -hmm. from Texas, who in fact, you know, picked cotton himself when he was like six or seven years old, who has come to LA, his family has no money, his mom is cleaning houses. The only reason he's at this school is that he's, you know, he's basically cheated and uses uses the address of the, there's like no black kids anywhere to be found in any kind of honorary organization, school politics. He walks in and somehow everyone votes for him, (laughs) right? And so this is the great, and then he goes on to be the, you know, he gets elected Black mayor of Los Angeles, and that's a city with only, whatever, 15% African Americans in it. He has this knack, in other words, of being the guy who appeals to white He's the black guy who appeals to white people, mm. right? And he was that his entire life. And part of what I'm trying to get at in this book is, what was going on with him? Because Obama does the same thing. Obama is kind of Tom Bradley a generation later. Mm. A lot more charismatic, and, you know, obviously different background, not... not 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 a poor background like Bradley, but they're very similar in that they have that crossover appeal. And what I'm fascinated by, by is, what is it? And they're both first. You know, the first people to appeal in that broad way from their own community. Um, I, I'm trying to put my finger on what is it that allows you to do that. So Bradley's Bradley's not, for example, charismatic like Obama. You can argue that well, maybe Obama was just so winning and warm and, um, you know intelligent and that you know even people had a problem with African Americans would vote for him uh, Bradley and, and in hindsight George Bush you know people don't see that now but they like to revise history but in hindsight people hated George and Bush and people hated George Bush. hated yeah. him but Bradley is not 
He's not charismatic. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a lot of the gifts that Obama had. Bradley did not have. I mean, he was good looking. He was thoughtful. He was super intelligent. But if he stood up in a room and tried to give a speech, I mean, he had a voice. He he droned. He was like, I've been listening to tape of him. He's like, this is not a charismatic guy. I mean, he, so like, it's really, it's sort of a so why the hell are you writing a whole book about him? Because I want to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> I want to figure that out. He's like, how do we get into this position? Yeah. What okay. drew you in? Something tried to draw you in. Like, Well, why? because he then goes on, I think he's one of the most underrated political figures in the 20th century in America. Mm. He's the guy who finally brings the LAPD to heel. Mm. Um, and he does it so skillfully, people don't even give him credit. He did it so kind of brilliantly. And I want to describe that. I want to rescue him from, I think, an unfair obscurity. I want to describe what he did with the LAPD because the story of <clears throat> the first really successful attempt to get a handle on how to how to curb police violence in this country was done in Los Angeles in the 1990s after Rodney King. Wow. Um, and that's Tom Bradley's story. But I also want to understand, I think this guy's remarkable. I mean, the man was elected student council president in 1937 mm -hmm. in a white school in Los Angeles. Do you know how hard that is? That is nuts, right? And I want to kind of understand, like, what is he? what did he do? So I've been talking to all these people who knew him and... What have you understood so far from it? Like, what conclusions have you come to? <clears throat> there is a certain, I mean, this sort of gets complicated, but there's a, if you think about, particularly in that era, what were people's prejudices, sort of implicit, unconscious prejudices about black men? And they were that black men were aggressive, were impulsive, were unpredictable, were, you know, they had a whole sort of thing, assumptions, without even thinking about it. You just, you saw a black guy, you thought, oh, they're going to, they could go off on me. They, they, gotta, they could get angry. Mm -hmm. They could get wild and violent. They could, that was what people, so part of what Bradley has is he communicates the opposite. When you, he has this kind of calm and stillness and discipline, incredible discipline. And I think even as a 17-year-old, that's putting people who would never imagine voting for an African-American, that was putting them at ease. That that's to, If you're going to be the first through the door, you have to communicate, you have to in some way answer um, those implicit prejudices about, about black people. And he does it in some way. He calms people down because, like I say, he, I mean, imagine he's 6'5", very deliberate, uh, very, he's the, he has an insane work ethic. He talks incredibly slowly and carefully and chooses each word. I think it's just people just see him and they go, oh, okay, he's safe. Was he able to see that's the thing, right? Was he able to keep the balance? Because a lot of times when you get that crossover appeal from white people and you are labeled safe, you lose credibility with black folks. That's the story of his career. So that's the second half of the book is all about that. He has to walk that line and it's really, really hard mm. because he's constantly under pressure from from black activists who are saying, You're you know, you're selling us out. Mm -hmm. You know, you're spending all your mm -hmm. time. And his whole point is if I don't continue to to serve the interests of the white population of Los Angeles, I won't be mayor anymore. That's and every I, politician. That's yeah, every Democrat. Yeah. Right. And now. I can't help you. If I'm not mayor, I can't help you at all. Right. And he has to walk that line. And it's an incredibly difficult and fascinating line for him. And he does it for he's mayor for 20 years. Okay, I'm sold on the book. You didn't, you, you didn't have me at first, Malcolm. 20 years first, is amazing. I'm sold wild. now. I can't wait to read it. That's why 20 years is mayor. 20 years. Never been a, never. Oh, they, they passed term limits after. They were like, but we can't have a black guy be mayor for that long again. So <laughs> term, the minute he's like, he, he resigns, they pass term limits. Now, what do you think can be done, uh, just to go back to the hypocrisy of the college ranking yeah. system, what do you think can be done to make HBCUs more appealing? Well, we have junk. <clears throat> we have to get rid of the ranking system. I think we have to... And I think HPs are starting to do this. They have to explain to people what they're doing and what makes them special. Mm -hmm. There is something very special. And you're seeing, you know, you mentioned Kamala Harris who went to Howard. There is a real flourishing right now of, I think, of HBCUs on a, a number of, you know, prominent people, you know, Kenya Bears, who I was, who, uh, 
whose shows I love. He loves you, by the way. Yeah. I, know, I love Kanye. He said he did. He's a genius. He's a genius. He's a genius. He I think he's a genius. He, he's a genius. He, he, he's a genius. he said he cares about what you think so much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did you see did you read that? Yeah, no, 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 no. He said he cares what you I, think. I, so much. Feeling is mutual with him, but there's a whole, you know, this there's a whole class of, of, uh, of really prominent people in this country who have come out of that, and I think that's what they are. This is an opportunity for HBCUs to stand up and say, you know, we're doing something different and something special, and providing uh, an educational environment and a culture that is not available elsewhere in the in the higher ed school system. And if they can make that argument um, powerfully and publicly, I think there's going to be, there will be a shift. You know, people will, it's starting to happen. People are starting to give money to these schools. They're starting to get the recognition they deserve. Yeah, Kenya you gave a million, I forgot who Kenya, he gave a million to one HBCU. He went to, he went to one of the Atlanta schools. He went to, not Clark, did he go to Clark? Or he went to, I don't remember. Yeah, he went to one of those in the, you know, the Morehouse, yeah, Spelman. There's only about Morehouse, Clark, and Spelman in that area. Yeah, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. You think with everything that's going on with, with uh, the fact that players have to go to college for one year to go mm-hmm. into the league, you think that's going to affect any of this at all? Because now, you know, you know, colleges are built on sports, and now the fact that these players might not have to go to college anymore, yeah. that means that money is <clears> not going to be there anymore. They can't rape those artists and just make money off of them. They can go to the G League immediately, get $500,000. Mm-hmm. You think that will affect ranking at all? That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I mean, it creates a problem for schools that have, you know, think of a school like Duke, which, you know, used to be a kind of forgotten school in the South, now is considered to be one of the crown jewels of American higher ed. They all, part of that was built around their basketball, basketball. success, right? So, mm. you know, when basketball doesn't matter at a school like Duke, what happens to Duke? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I mean, it's really an interesting thought. I mean, maybe basketball means something at these schools. Maybe it's all like for your kids, and the quality of the play is a little less, but we get to enjoy it in a different way. I don't. I don't think that G, I, I'm sort of. I'm in favor of the of these changes in the G League in particular. I think maybe it's time to separate the elite players from everybody else and just enjoy college I also basketball think for that, what it is. You know, HBCUs do a lot better as far as ranking and, P, and kids wanting to go. Mm. If like let's say let's say you're a star basketball player, you play high school, you know that if you go to an HBCU, nine times out of ten, people are not going to see you. Yeah, it's not going to be on television. That's right. It's not yeah. going to be aired. So you go to a school like Duke or, or Florida, and you know you will get that airtime that can mm. possibly get a look that can get you into the league. So yeah, until they change that and we find a way to change that, maybe BET airing some of the HBCU games, mm. I, I think we'll always have that problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean imagine if like Kevin Durant had gone to. Morehouse instead of Texas. I mean, like that's that would have, that would really have changed uh, the national equation. I sort of think. I mean, I, you only, Kevin Durant's proof. You only need Kevin. You don't need anybody else. If he, if he went, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Just give him four other guys, and he's fine. <laughs> By the way, if these guys are only going to go to college for a year, go to an HBCU. Now you can make money off your jersey and stuff like that. Like it would be, shoot through and, the roof. And, but more than that, and you could have an experience, an important mm-hmm. experience. A real educational experience, and and maybe go back and finish your your degree when you're done playing. Yeah, uh, this is like my last question on the HBCUs. But aside from the ranking list, how do you think people view HBCUs on the grand scale in America? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a difference between the way they were viewed historically, because remember their their roots are in a period where uh, where these schools were were segregated. Mm-hmm. So you know, they were, they, they were, they started as kind of ulcerans where, uh, where African-Americans went because they couldn't go to other schools. Not mm-hmm. ulcerans is the wrong word, but that's the way white people viewed them, mm-hmm. right? Like the, this, this is where we're going to, where we're going to put uh, uh, black people because we're not letting them in our own schools. Um, I think that, like I said before, I think that attitude is now changing and people are becoming more and more aware of what is special and powerful about the experience of going to these schools. Um, and I think people are, the other thing is we're getting, I hopefully think we're getting away from a model which says um, that, there's, that there's a kind of one size fits all notion of quality, right? That it's, you know, the, the, my real problem with rankings is it assumes that, that you can say that one school is number one and one school is number two. And that holds true for anyone who wants to go to those schools. Mm-hmm. It's just not true, right? right? We've got to go back to an idea that says there ought to be 50 different kinds of schools 
that serve 50 different kinds of students that have 50 different kinds of cultures. And you need to find the one that matches what's good for you. Mm. I wanted to ask you about uh, books real quick. Is it even worth putting out hardcover books anymore? Because I look at the numbers you did for talking to strangers mm -hmm. audio-wise. <laughs> Is it even worth it? Not for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be you should be doing these kinds of... I mean, you already have an audience that wants to hear you, that listen to you, mm -hmm. right? That's used to listening to you, That and, and you have, uh, you know, things to say. I mean, I think for if you're if you were writing a you know a history of the Roman Republic, I would say that's a hardcover book. Mm -hmm. um, but if the stuff you want to talk about and given your position, I think an audio you're you should be an audio first person. Mm. I Absolutely. prefer books all the time. But yeah, but you would listen to an audio book. I think I honestly. Wait, I can't believe she's like. No, I mean, no, I mean, I mean that's I mean, I, business-wise, I mean, you're absolutely I, right. I also like how books look. Like, I, to yeah. me, books kind of look like art. Because I have libraries in every room in my house. Like, I have bookshelves mm -hmm. and everything. And I collect books like art, you know, and I like to have them, and I like to get them, like, signed and keep them like that. And I also read more than I listen to audiobooks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, at this point, I'm audiobooks all day. I think it depends on the story you want to tell. Like, the story I was telling about this book I want to do on, a, on Tom Bradley in Los Angeles I want to do a really, I want to do what we call an enhanced audio book because I want you to hear all these people. Mm. I want you to, you know, I want you to hear Tom Bradley. I want you to hear Daryl Gates. I want you to hear the emotion in people's voices. I was interviewing this guy last week and he was talking about um, what the LAPD used to call the prone position. You know, they would pull you over and, you know, for some random offense and they would tell you to get prone. And that meant that you would, you had to lie down on the uh, face first on the tarmac with your hands out and your legs spread, right? And he was talking about, you know, if it was a hundred degrees out and the tarmac is, you know, however hot, it doesn't matter. Your nose is pressed to the, and he, this had happened to him. And as he was talking about it, there was real emotion in his voice as he remembered this humiliating experience that happened to him as a kid. That's important to me. I want, when I'm doing this book and I'm describing what the LAPD was doing in those years, it is important to me that you hear the testimony of someone in their own voice mm. and that you hear how he is now a, this guy's a, this is 30 years ago. He's a grown man. He's a successful man, gone off. And when he remembers what happened to him when he was 18 on some street in South Central, he gets emotional, right? And you need to hear that emotion. Right. That's why I want to do an audiobook. I can do it on the page, but it doesn't pack the same. And you can, if you're someone who has no experience of what it meant, like what it was like being an 18 year old African American in 1975 yeah. in South Central, you can turn the page easily and doesn't register. But if you hear his voice and you hear how it still you captivate stings, it. Yeah. it holds you. So is this going, it's going to be for Audible, the Tom Bradley? Yeah, book? it's going to be an audiobook, yeah. For, for uh, Audible or just, or for, just Audible? Well, we'll also release it probably on our own. We have our. I know our own direct uh, download uh, at Pushkin that we uh, release our audiobooks. But yeah, it'll be in both places. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, wow. We appreciate you for joining us. Thank you so much. Always, man. Always fun. Always a pleasure hearing you from guys. you. Malcolm yeah. Gladwell, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Yeah.